So Battelle was founded through the will of Gordon Battelle, which was written in 1920. And Gordon died in 1923, left some money. His mother died in 1925, left actually more money than Gordon Battelle did, three and a half million, pre-depression, pre-Wall Street crash. And the company was founded in 25 when she died. That three and a half million is worth about 45 million in today's currency, accounting for inflation and so on. And we opened for business in 1929, and there have, I'm the eighth director, eighth president and CEO. And I have the, rec I have the reading, the, the writings and the recollections from the first three directors. They wrote their unofficial memoirs. They weren't books. They were, you know, 20-page summaries of what they did. And I think the answer to your question goes back to the founding of the company. And in a sense, we're the technical equivalent of the quiet company. When I think of innovation, I think about the invention of something new, not necessarily a product, it could be a service, it could be a process, and it leads to a useful outcome. Innovation is vital for the future of our country. Um, certainly the science and technology components of innovation is uh, I think reported to account for almost 50% of the economic uh, growth in our country. Yeah, what are the benefits of innovation? They're, they're very broad. They're, they're products which leads to financial return, but I prefer to think of it in terms of economic growth, social well-being, uh, less, less strife. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, it sounds like motherhood and apple pie, but countries that are financially in very good shape tend to have less crime and so on and so forth. They tend to have, not always. But I think that the economic cycle that comes with successful innovation is beneficial to society. I have tried in the past to study innovative groups. And there are some iconic examples. Um, you know, Xerox Park, the Manhattan Project. Um, there's, there's, there's maybe a dozen very interesting stories. And, and if you try and look at what, what ties them all together, um, it's, it's more about the passion for the outcome. The, the question of whether an inventor can do it on their own or, or need, needs others is something we've actually tried both directions on in terms of how we have invested in our inventors and inventions. At the end of days, my belief is you're better off being leveraged, by which I mean you're better off getting other people to invest in your ideas for several reasons. Although you lose some of the value, you gain other opinions about the merit of the idea. In other words, as other people are willing to invest in your idea, it's a ratification or an endorsement that you may have something. And if you don't have that external endorsement, you, I think you could lead yourself off into a place where you have something very interesting that nobody wants. But it's very interesting to you. But there isn't a real market for it. Or you've, you, you're not aware of the competitor out here that's got a widget that's a little bit better. Or they've got the financial structure to take it to market faster. Or they've done the marketing studies and you're sitting here on your own imagining you can do all of that. And in fact, there's a lot of different skills needed to bring an invention to the market. And the chance of you having all of them, not very high. There is always a genius that does, but I, I tend not to meet those in terms of being, you know, one person who can do everything. I, I, I like to surround myself with experts. I think if somebody comes in the front door with a passion around their invention with a lot of patents and explains that the world doesn't think it's important because once you've copied the Library of Congress, you're done. You know, I think he'd get a different reception. I think we'd take it very seriously. 
we get a lot of inquiries from a lot of people. Every so often I go into work and there's a strange invention being sent to me. I have to say a lot of them defy the laws of physics as we now understand them. <laughs> On the other hand, there's always the opportunity that somebody's done something very interesting. Um, there's a lot of clever, inventive people out there who aren't formally educated in the sense that we look for when we hire people. A lot of people inventing. Well, we, we know. We just look at some of the uh, successes in today's marketplace of people who've you know, done it in a very unorthodox route. And, and so I think you always have to be open to the opportunity that somebody, somebody uh, so we look at everything. If somebody sends us something, we take a look at it. Uh, for example, you know, I went to Beijing several, well, I go there periodically, but several years ago I went to their nanoscience center. And so I asked, how, how was this supported? How was it funded? And it wasn't funded by the Chinese government. It was funded by a Taiwanese entrepreneur who had found the hundred million dollars and invested it there. And apparently the business base was 50 percent of the intellectual property returns. Were, was the basic deal. So you go somewhere to a distant land and you find that the people working there have been in your laboratory. You find the equipment is state-of-the-art. You find the funding mechanisms are in the private sector. Or you go to Infosys, you know, in, in Bangalore. And the first problem I have there is I feel like I'm in another world not because I am in another world in India, but because everyone's 23. That's the average age on the campus. The average age here is 49. And you see all these people working together on products that you're buying or, or watching come onto the market. And at some point, you have to say, how do we engage? How do we bring all of that to, to our benefit? And so for that reason, we've, for the last few years, been exploring activities in China India, Singapore, South Korea, Japan, and so on. You know, I think we explore partnerships in every dimension now. You know, when we're competing for, whether we're competing for a lab or looking for a product development, we're always asking where's the best place to do it versus who's our best person inside necessarily. So I think, I think that's true. You know, I think a small business can, in a sense, um, if, if they know how to collect resources, be highly successful without having to be part of a large enterprise. In fact, you could argue that companies have recognized this by spinning off those areas that are innovative because they don't want to clutter them with the routine of a large corporate enterprise, Skunk Works being a good example at Lockheed, and there are others. So I, I think it is a leveling factor. Uh, because sometimes it does come down to one or two individuals, and then the question is, what's the environment they're in? Are they in one that encourages it, that has the financial resources to support it? Because it's expensive; it can be expensive, as you know. So sometimes it's about innovation in partnerships. Who are you going to work with? Who are you going to partner with? Are you able to bring that intellectual property together? Are people willing to share ideas? That's something that's a big deal. You bring 20 people in a room from our laboratories in Vattel now. Is there a culture, an atmosphere that allows them to share their best ideas? That's important. So this not invented here syndrome is really intriguing. When I first started work at, at Lockheed Corporation, the Missiles and Space Company in Palo Alto, at their research lab, um, that was really the height of the not invented here syndrome. If we wanted a capability, we bought it. It was almost a badge of honor to you know, bring as much stuff in as you could. I'd say today, not invented here is given way to proudly found elsewhere. You know, people come in and say, hey, we don't have to do this. We've found the best place in the world to do it. So I think the whole flat earth thing, you know, and it's a flat, flat world or whatever, uh, all of that Asian experience, the, the recognition that there's talent around the world has started to focus us on where's the best solution instead of having to own it. So we have a business perspective on innovation. We say not only is it new, but is it useful? And is there a useful society that we can uh, further?
So innovation, yes, it's really important. How do we encourage it? Well, we encourage it in lots of ways. Uh, first of all, it's part of who we are. We, we came out of a, a history of a, a man who was intrigued by why it was so hard to get discovery into the marketplace. He'd, he'd spotted this back in World War I with armor that was developed at Ohio State University, and he wondered why it wasn't finding application in, in, in the uh, defense of soldiers, as a matter of fact. And so he, he, he devoted his, his life and then his fortune, he bequeathed his fortune, to furthering the purpose of translating invention to application. And we, of course, ca carry that through. And we do it in many, many ways. Uh, we provide, for example, um, new solutions to customer problems. So a customer, maybe the Army or the Air Force or this part of the commercial sector, will come to us with a problem. And we will maybe put together a multifaceted team in a way that others cannot. Or we may use equipment, facilities, techniques to try and solve that problem. So at one end, we, we work with customers who have a problem. There's another end where we're doing basic research, applied research, and we're inventing new things that we then seek a marketplace for that. So we run the spectrum from being asked to solve a particular problem to generating new knowledge and then, quite frankly, seeking markets for it and everything in between. Uh, how do we do this? Well, part of it's our culture. It's an expectation of Battelle that we're in that kind of work. Part of it is through fin financing and funding the kinds of enterprises that encourage it. For example, we have our own venture fund, which takes early stage technology to the marketplace, leveraged with other venture funds along the way. Uh, we invest in basic research. We have our own science and technology investments. The laboratories we manage invest quite heavily in basic and early stage research. We have funds that we put aside to develop technology to get them ready for a venture fund. They may be too early for most venture funds, so we encourage the movement towards an application with our own uh, resources. We try and encourage the concept of in innovation and invention to be more than just widgets. We talk quite a lot nowadays about business innovation. We talk about process innovation. And we have specific examples where were it not for a business innovation, the technology wouldn't have moved ahead. And there are many examples in our current industry, iPods and uh, Twitters and all sorts of things that have generated a tremendous market. And it's more about the business side of it than it is the technology per se, which has been around for a while. We think of our businesses as being in three segments. That there's, there's low risk, medium risk, and high risk. And the low risk, and I hesitate to say this, is, is managing our big laboratories. So we manage nine laboratories in this country and around the world. Um, some of them are as, you know, one to two billion dollars a year with five, six thousand people. Then the work we do here in Columbus, which is more of the contract research, FIFA service, that's higher risk. Uh, customers come and go, you can have a sudden decision that causes a major uplift or downturn in the business, and the fees are higher, so that's medium risk. And then ventures is flat out high risk, and you're looking for high returns. So we don't bet the farm on any one segment. We try and distribute the risk and the returns across a spectrum. So it's a complicated question you've asked, because in each of those three segments, we seek innovation going to the marketplace. However, the terms of how we do it and the risks associated with it and the returns are quite different. So the returns on commercialization of our labs are relatively small, but you could always hit a home run, as you could here. In ventures, we kind of hope to hit a couple of home runs in those 30 companies we've created with that, that, that uh, rather large amount of money we've invested. And I'm reminded of that at most of my board meetings, I might add. What we like to say is, it's OK to fail. And we like to say, if you're not failing, you're not stretching the envelope or going to the edge. Uh, whereas in reality, when you fail, you really don't like it. And it's rather hard to encourage failure. <laughs> so it's hard to put it in those terms. You know, we encourage um, high-risk work. Uh, when, it, when it fails, it actually is quite a disappointment. And it's difficult to sort of put that in the, it's OK to fail bucket.
It, it, it's, it's, so it's easy to say, difficult to actually do. But, but you have to recognize that the data, the statistics, history tells you that if you're in high-risk work, high-risk investments, you're just not going to make it all the time, and that that's okay. So we don't expect every venture investment to return five times its investment or whatever. Um, on the other hand, some of them have to. So you can accept failure more readily if you're in a portfolio that has overall success. There are some things we refuse to fail at. The, the culture of innovation here is, is one that is designed to encourage risk taking. The more the investment, the more checks and balances we do along the way, though. I mean, that's reality. You don't give somebody 1.6 billion and say, see you in six years, hope it works out, if you're, if you're building a massive facility for scientific use. But yes, um, so for example, we will have certain pockets of investment where we only want to see things that nobody's been able, no, nobody else has been able to do. And that, by definition, is, is high risk, whether it's seeing through an air cargo container for you know, protection of, the, of airplanes, or, or whether it's getting to the next stage of, of toxicology understanding for drug development by using techniques no one else has used. We, we invite those proposals. In fact, we only fund those. So we, we are trying to, in a sense, make as much money as we can through good revenue in order to do more good. So it's a, it's a wonderful engine. The more money we make, the more we can reinvest in R&D and give to our philanthropic purposes, primarily in education. So we've been able to do a great deal of work in STEM schools. We work with the Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation. So these are wonderful things where we're able to create schools. Um, Battelle for Kids is a spin-off company that's been wildly successful, which measures performance in the classroom and by teachers. And so this is part of an engine of, of education and invention and science and technology. And the more you make, the more you can do. And so we are unabashed in wanting to be successful financially. It simply means there's more to do more good with. And that's a great engine. How would Gordon Patel feel if he walked in the front door kind of thing? Um, well, I, I, it's hard to project what somebody in 1920, how they thought, and because so many things weren't invented then. You know, it's, it's, it's always an interesting question of, of what would somebody think, or, you know, 80 years on from the front. He was a very good businessman. So although he had a passion about invention and had, his own, had a patent of his own, he was also a very, very good businessman, as was his father. So I think one dimension would have been, boy, you guys have really grown the business. So I think he'd have been pleased with that. I think he would have looked at the products that we've made and said, yeah, you got that right. That was what I wanted to do. I wanted to see things in the marketplace. I think other things would astonish him. You know, I think the fact that there's a plaque on an orphanage in India with his name on it probably would surprise him. Um, so it's, it's hard to say. But I think on the whole, I like to think he'd be pleased.